As I mentioned before a few times, I never had a Super Nintendo growing up. I had one friend with NBA Jam and another friend with Mario Kart. Other than that, I don't really have any memories of the system. I never owned a SNES until I became a collector. That's what I love about doing these quest videos. I'm discovering a whole generation of games I missed out on as I do these quest videos. There's games I would never pop in if it wasn't for the quest, but it turns out I'm actually really enjoying them, even some of the sports games. That being said, I really enjoy discovering this library with you guys. Also, we're almost at a thousand subscribers. At the time of making this video, I have 972 subscribers. Granted, I do make these videos a couple weeks in advance because I'm trying to be consistent with releasing these videos. So who knows what the count is going to be when you guys are actually watching this. But my goal is to have a thousand subscribers by the end of the year. So I do appreciate all the support in you watching these videos. So please smash that like button. And remember, when this is one of the biggest video game channels on YouTube, you have bragging rights of being here before a thousand subs. I'm just messing with you guys. Today we have six games that we'll be adding to the library. Let's check them out. I got these six games at a store for a bundle price. So I'll be telling you what each one was priced for, but I'll be adding them to the price counter at the end of the video, telling you what I paid for the whole lot. And the first game we have up, is Blackthorn. Blackthorn was developed by Blizzard Entertainment and published by Interplay. It released for the Super Nintendo in 1994. Blackthorn is a cinematic platform game. The cover art for the game was done by Jim Lee, who is a famous comic book artist and writer. Long story short, there are two brothers. Their father passes away and turns into two stones. One is a light stone, one is a dark stone. The civilization splits into two, with half the people going with the light stone and the other half going with the dark. The people that went with the dark start to mutate and cause chaos, so Kyle Blackthorn goes on a quest to get the light stone and save the day. Before starting the actual game, you can choose a practice mode that will teach you the basic controls of the game. You'll learn how to talk to people, how to climb, how to battle and how to run and jump. Like most games of the genre, the controls are really stiff. This is because the movement of the character aims to be realistic. The buttons have double functions, so they can take some time getting used to. For example, the Y button is used to run when your shotgun is put away, but if your gun is out, you use the Y button to shoot behind you. So you can go to run and accidentally blast a friendly behind you. Sorry bro. You also have to put your gun away to go through doors, climb ladders, or jump on ledges. It feels somewhat robotic, and jumping across gaps can feel really clunky. It sounds like the controls are terrible, but they're really not when you start getting used to them. The visuals are really great for a game of this type, and the music matches the environment excellent. The game does a good job of giving you a dark feeling like it was trying to portray. The gameplay is a lot of fun trying to figure out the way to progress through each level. At the end of each level, you're given a password, so you can restart the game on whatever level you left off on. If you die in a level, you start from the beginning of that level. Overall, Blackthorn is a fun game and definitely worth checking out. Blackthorn is game number 48 for the collection, and this game was priced at $150 in the store. The next game up is the same type of game we just covered, and it was by complete chance that I added this game at the same time as Blackthorn. And that game is Prince of Persia. Prince of Persia was published by Konami porting to the SNES in 1992. Prince of Persia is also a cinematic platform game. The story in this game is Jafar wants to kill the Sultan and take over the kingdom. He also wants to marry the princess, so he locks the prince in the dungeon and the princess in a room at the top of the palace. He gives the princess an ultimatum. She must marry him or die, and she only has two hours to decide. Sounds exactly like Aladdin, only this game came out first. The guy's name is even Jafar. Just like in Blackthorn, you have a training option to learn the controls and basics of the game. When you start the actual game, you're given a two hour time limit to rescue the princess. The controls are finicky and take some practice, especially the jumping. You want to avoid running towards ledges because your character continues to run a little bit even after you let go of the run button. To prevent yourself from going too far, you have to hold the A button down and scooch along. The game takes a ton of trial and error. There are parts of the game where you have to take leaps of faith off the screen to get to the next platform. 
I'm not a fan of that at all. The enemies are pretty easy in the beginning, but some can one shot kill you. Anyone playing the game for the first time will die many, many times. When you die, you go back to the beginning of the level. Unfortunately, you're not in the clear. Remember the timer? It doesn't reset when you die and start the level over. So every time you die, it counts against you. The graphics and sound in the game are decent, and the gameplay is fun once you get the hang of it all. However, if I had to choose a cinematic platforming game to play, I'd choose Blackthorn over this one. Prince of Persia is game number 49 for the collection, and the store had this one priced at $50. And the next game up is Kawasaki Caribbean Challenge. Kawasaki Caribbean Challenge was developed by Park Place Productions and published by Game Tech. It released exclusively for the Super Nintendo in 1993. That's right, this game is such a pile of trash, no one else wanted it on their console. When I turned on the game and saw Park Place Productions, it rang a bell. What other games did I review that were developed by them? Oh yeah, ESPN Speed World and ESPN Baseball Tonight. I gave this game a chance thinking it might be their saving grace, but this game just makes me certain I found my least favorite developer for the SNES. In Caribbean Challenge, you can choose to race ninja bikes or jet skis. When racing bikes, the bike you choose is basically selecting your difficulty level. You have the 599cc Ninja ZX6, which is the slowest, up to the Ninja ZX11, which is the fastest bike. You're given three tracks to choose from. Each track gets progressively harder. Racing is where you'll begin to hate this game. First, there are the controls. The controls are really rigid, and it can be hard to keep your bike in a straight line on the straightaways. What's worse than the controls are the obstacles. The whole track is clear except the corners. They put water, sand, and oil at every single turn. You will hit it, and it will wreck you. And when you wreck, it puts you so far behind. When racing other bikes, it's like bumper cars. And the hit detection of the other bikes is huge. You can't be anywhere near them when trying to pass. And don't even think about trying to pass on a corner. The opponents will just knock you into a road hazard. The jet skis are the same as the bikes, only instead of road hazards, you have whirlpools. You race on the same three islands as the bikes, only in the water. The instruction manual even admits the controls are difficult because they made them intentionally hard to master. That's just a cover up for making a game with shoddy controls. The visuals aren't bad and the game is colorful. The music isn't bad either, but it'll get stuck in your head after you finish playing the game. The gameplay is frustrating and isn't really that exciting. Overall, Kawasaki Caribbean Challenge is a game to avoid. Save your money for a real trip to the Caribbean. And Kawasaki Caribbean Challenge is game number 50, and this game was priced at $25. And the next game up is Hyper V-Ball. Hyper V-Ball was developed by Video System and published by Miko River. It spiked onto store shelves in 1994. Hyper V-Ball is a volleyball game. Starting off the game, you have a bunch of different options you can select to tailor the game to your liking. You can change difficulty level, ball speed, how many special points you start out with, which we'll get into later, and you can choose a men's, women, or hyper league. Playing the game as a men's or women's league feels like a simulation volleyball game. It's pretty slow paced overall, even if you selected the fast ball speed. It's a lot of the same patterns over and over again, and the gameplay is monotonous. Timing is critical in the game. It takes some time to get a good feel for the game. The graphics are decent and you don't have any trouble seeing what's going on in the game. The music is there, but it's nothing special. The game is slow paced and boring. That is until you play the Hyper League. This is where my view of the game completely changed. You play the game as cyborgs and you have a myriad of special moves you can perform to psych out the enemy. Special hits and serves you special points that we talked about earlier. The game changes from a simulation game to an arcade style game in this mode. You can do crazy serves and hits that will knock your opponents out and Rabia will appear to pick up the injured player. Yes, I forgot to mention the game was developed by the same people that created Arrow Fighters. If you're looking for a fun v-ball game to play with a friend, Hyper v -ball is worth checking out just for the Hyper League mode. Hyper V-Ball is game number 51 for the collection and this game was priced at $80. And the next game we have up is Warp Speed. Warp Speed was developed and published by Accolade. It was available to purchase in 1992. Warp Speed is a space flight simulator game where you destroy aliens. There are a ton of different scenarios to choose from, but the gameplay is all the same. You fly around the galaxy hunting different enemies and avoid asteroids. You'll get an occasional call with a challenge from a hotshot alien pilot. When you go and defeat him, nothing happens. If you fail a mission, nothing happens. The moral of the story? 
nothing happens. This game shouldn't have happened. The graphics are awful. This game doesn't look like a Super Nintendo game at all. Everything is so bland. The music is annoying and doesn't match what's going on in the game at all. The gameplay is terrible. You'll be chasing enemies around when you go to battle them. Speed up, slow down, turn it all around. Do whatever you want, the enemies are going to do what they want to do. And none of your controller inputs are going to allow you to properly fight them. There are only four main types of enemies with different strengths. This banana here is the third strongest enemy in the game. Just so you're aware, you'll never get through this game without the instruction manual. It has some of the strangest commands I've ever seen in a game. Just to start, you have to hit the L button to open up the door and take off. Overall, Warp Speed is not a game I recommend. I'd be warping it straight to the trash with some speed if I didn't need it for my collection. And Warp Speed is game number 52 for the collection and it was priced at $30. Last but not least, we have Legend. Legend was developed by Arcade Zone and published by Seika. It slashed onto the Super Nintendo in 1994. Legend is a beat-em-up game. The story goes, Beldor reigned over the kingdom of Selich for a thousand years. The people imprisoned him, but now his son, Clovis, wants to harness Beldor's power and take over the kingdom. Visually, the game looks great. The sprites are big and well-defined, and the scenery is well done. The weather effects in the game are a really nice touch too, but there is a downfall with the visuals. Everything in the game is recycled. The enemies are constantly repeated with a few new ones sprinkled in occasionally. They even use the same scenery throughout the game. They just change the color. Oh, it's red now, no one's gonna notice. The music is good and matches the gameplay well, but just like the visuals, it repeats itself. The controls are responsive for the most part, but you have to stop swinging your weapon to turn around. However, you'll quickly find out that there are so many enemies constantly ambushing you that you don't really need to use your weapon. It's easiest just to jump kick your way through the game. The enemies drop all kinds of items when they're defeated. You can find food to replenish health, gold which gives you points, keys which let you unlock bonus chests at the end of some levels, and also potions. Potions can be used for magic attacks. Each magic attack takes two potions, but you can only store a total of nine potions. So you'll want to save your potions for boss battles, because bosses are far more challenging than any other enemies you'll come across. Overall, Legend is an okay beat-em-up game. However, there are better ones on the system. And Legend is game number 53 for the collection, and it was priced at $230. But I ended up getting all six games for a bundle deal of $500. And at $500, that brings our total up to $13,631 for the Super Nintendo Complete in Box Quest. Let's get these games on the shelf. If you enjoyed the video, please make sure to subscribe and I'll be bringing you more videos like this. Also make sure to leave a thumbs up for Blackthorn. Until next time, I'm Gamer Wayne and thanks for watching.